do you think that the, the left uh, take, take Jewish goodwill for granted? Does that mm. question make sense? Sure, it's an interesting question. Well, one of the things in the book, um, and actually I use Hadley in the book uh, mm. as a reference point for this, is that uh, most Jews, certainly not all Jews, and, uh, you know, Hugo's dad it, it was a member of the Tory cabinet, so it's not completely true, but Jews, uh, I think of as sort of my generation, were kind of, I think, defaultly, yeah, left wing. Mm. Um, you know, I went to a, a complicated thing now uh, when I was young, uh, a socialist Zionist youth movement <laughs> called Hub One Im. But when I was going to it, that wasn't a contradiction because of kibbutz and stuff yeah. like that. And the project of that Jewish youth group was that you should end up on kibbutz, which was the nearest thing really to kind of communism at that point in time, sort of local, rather idyllic <laughs> communism <laughs> with a handsome people in it. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think that it then became a shock for most Jews as we got older and Israel became more of a bete noir of the left, that we were not perhaps welcome or natural bedfellows with the left. And yeah. this book, although I, I hope it's other things as well, is partly about that alienation, yeah. Do you, can I, I, say, I go on. Just, just coming back on that, I wonder if you're, I wonder if you're conflating Jews with metropolitan Jews, which might seem a bit ludicrous, because admittedly in Britain, British countries, you don't get very many Jews anywhere else. But I mean, as, as a, certainly in Scotland, there wasn't a huge, I mean, there was a bit, I guess there was a bit of a Glasgow left-wing Jewish tradition, but it also wasn't, my dad wasn't an, an anomaly, you know, because he was very much a product of this next generation immigrant society where you want your kids to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, right. and, you know, and so my, so I, I grew up in a community of, of, of opticians and dentists and chiropodists and solicitors, well, advocates in Scotland. And, um, so, did and I, was, so did I, but they were all left-wing. Well, but that wasn't, that just, I mean, they, they may have been, but that wasn't a defining, defining, defining feature. And it makes me wonder if there's something, if there's something sort of, I don't know, I don't even quite know how to phrase it, but there's something Holocaust versus non-Holocaust there. <laughs> as, in, as in the expectation is that your you're Holocaust surviving Jews probably throughout the latter half of the 20th century did veer left. Whether your Shettle descended Jews, who had perhaps been here rather longer did, I'm not sure if that's necessarily true. Yeah, the only uh, argument this is, is Simon, who's a sperm bank descended Jew. <laughs> <laughs> Wiesner, for what it's worth, left in the 19, I think 1928. He left for Edinburgh, funny enough. He, oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. But he was an academic. He was a, a, a scientist. The um, I think there is something in that, and it probably transcends the Jewishness to some extent, that if you're involved in politics on the left, you tend to be quite activist, whereas if you're successful... If you're a lawyer or, or you're successful in finance or, or whatever, you might lead what would seem to the outside world to be what would seem to be a conservative lifestyle or, or um, supports quite, but it would be quiet, wouldn't it? It would be much quieter. You would be much less likely to attend meetings, I suppose. But then that's how the right have always operated, I suppose, because there's a sort of a maintenance of the status quo and, and wanting to give the, in the same way that banks build huge stone edifices to try and conceal the extraordinarily contingent nature of their business. You know, the right of always kind of, uh, you get fringe meetings over pubs, you know, uh, during the 1980s, the National Front or whatever, you know, that is when you have an extreme right wing. But the conservative movement, generally speaking, don't feel the need to uh, stand on street corners handing out newspapers. When I say that in the book, actually, I talk about the left being a fighty space. Yeah. That, that yeah. it's part of being left wing that you are on the barricades because if you're right wing you're kind of happier with the status quo and the yeah. idea that it will lead to a trickle down or whatever. Do you think but... that to, to be absolutely blunt do you think that's part of what might appeal to some Jews about it my friend our friend Dave Cohen I think you know Dave uh, has said that there's Dave something Cohen, yeah. in the Talmudic Talm is, um, pronounce it correctly, Talmudic, Talmudic, Talmudic yeah. of just enjoying argument almost for its own sake of engaging with intellectual you know wrangling things out uh, I, I think that's slightly different from the fightiness. Yeah. The fightiness, I think, which is very important in my book, uh, because I think the need to stick it to the man that left-wing people have and to punch up against power and the fact that power gets blurred with yeah. Jews, basically, and there's no recognition of that amongst some people on the left. That's a very important 
issue. The yeah. fact that John Cusack uh, in the book can have a tweet of a hand crushing the world's poor yes. and they follow the money and really approve of that and not notice that there's a Star of David stamped on that hand is sort of unbelievable. But it's to do with that need to say, I am a rebel, I am a fighter against uh, power. Whereas what you're talking about is something slightly different, which I think is a Jewish thing which yeah. is loving a long discussion and, <laughs> you know, uh, really wanting to talk about you know, angels on a pin socially and politically. I just wanted to come back to Hadley, though, because yeah. to, to, I have used her as a reference point in my book, particularly in the last bit, uh, as someone who I felt expressed in a tweet that she put out this sort of anger and rage and disappointment at what she calls the anti-racist left's inability to you know, fold in Jews and Jewishness to their great monitoring of offence. And I mean, mm. I assume I called that right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then I'm criticized for saying that. And then yeah. I have to go back and like qualify my statement, yeah. um, which is something that happened as well when I wrote a column about it in The Guardian, uh, when they're saying, you know, isn't it ironic that all these people, I wrote a column last summer saying, yeah, there is a certain irony in seeing all these people now, you know, talking so much about the importance of listening to black voices and BAME voices, and we must listen to their experiences of racism. And isn't it ironic that the people who are saying that were the ones who were shouting at Jews to shut up. We don't know what anti-Semitism is. Mm. Corbyn is an anti-Semitic, you know, listen to the non-Jews, they know better. Mm. Um, mm. And I wrote that column and I got a lot of criticism for it. And I said something similar in a tweet. And I also got a lot of criticism for it. And, you know, the intimation, the criticism, it always comes in, you're suggesting people listen to black people, black people are ignored. It's like, I'm not saying that. I'm genuinely not saying that. I'm saying that, yes, it's great. Black people are being listened to now. Isn't it ironic that the Jewish people still aren't? <laughs>